You are worthy, God. You are worthy, worthy of all praise. praise. And my heart, and my heart will sing. How great is our God? It is our God. He really is a great God. He really is a great God. Yeah. He really is a great God. He really is a great God. Come on, say. He really is a great God. He really is a great God. Lift him up, come on, say. He really is a great God. He really is a great God. Yeah. He really is a great God. He really is a great God. Come on, say, he really is a great. He really is a great God. He really is a great God. Come on, say, he really is a great. He really is a great God. 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 That's who you. That's who you are. 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 A great God. A mighty God. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's who you are. A mighty God. A great God. A worthy God. A mighty God. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's who you are. A great God. Great Jehovah. Great Jehovah. Prince of Peace. Mighty God. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's who you are. My Savior. My Lord. My Deliverer. My strength. My wheel in the middle of the wheel. That's who you are. My healer. My keeper. My strength. My covering. My deliverer. That's who you are. My comfort. That's who you are. 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 Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. That's who he is, isn't it? Praise the Lord, our God, an awesome God, an awesome God, great God. Hallelujah, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. We're going to continue in our service on this morning, praise the Lord, with the word of God. Amen, amen, a full course meal, full course meal, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So you may take your seats at this time. I'm going to be introducing our speaker this morning. Our speaker is no stranger to this pulpit. One of our own, we don't allow, don't allow familiarity to cause you to miss this word. We know the word of God is quick and ever producing. So be prepared for this Kairos moment right now for the word of God. Amen. So receive the unique and personal delivery of our speaker this morning, none other than our very own Reverend Lorraine DeBetha. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. We welcome her to the pulpit this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on and bless the Lord. Come on and give God praise in this house. He's worthy of glory. He's worthy of honor. And he's worthy of praise. Oh, that men would magnify the name of our Lord and God and King. God, we bless you. We give you glory. We give you honor. And we give you praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. God is great and greatly to be praised. I greet you all in the matchless and mighty name of Jesus. You could be seated for just a quick second. I'd be very ungrateful 
if ever given the opportunity to stand before you. I know my family said a video, but it was August 9th, the last time that I was in this pulpit, that the Holy Spirit gave me a word to talk about the audacity of faith. And little did I know that four days later, I would need it the most. So I want to first say to my family, thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> Refuge, I knew you were a loving church, but you don't know how much until you go through it. So I thank you. I give God thanks for you. I greet my pastor and first lady in their absence. And I knew that I had been on, I won't say sabbatical, but uh, a little time off. And uh, so in my mind, and my fellow peers will agree, you think that you have some things working because you know time is coming. And when I spoke with Bishop last week, I began to give him something about, okay, sir, I'm ready. This is what we're going to talk about. And he said, um, oh, no. And what I'm grateful to God is that I'm sharing with you a little bit of my devotion, and I'm realizing how God puts pieces together. So we talked about the audacity of faith. And today we are going to talk about when all you have is all that you need. When I look back over my life and I see all of the things that God's done for me, I've been through dangers, heartaches, and troubles. I thank the Lord he's rescued me. I could have been dead and gone, but the Lord, he spared my life. And I thank him, for I am still here. And it's by the grace, the grace of God. When I look back over my life and I see all the things, the Lord's brought me through, been through trials, sickness, and suffering. I thank the Lord he's blessed me still. I could have lost the faith, and I could have fell from his grace. Now I can say that I am still here, and it's by the grace, the grace of God. I am still here, and it's by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Father, I bless you. I give you glory. I give you honor. I give you praise this morning. Father, we declare today that it's not in of ourselves, but God, it's because of your goodness and your grace, and we just want to thank you. Father, I just want to thank you for your grace and the spirit of thanksgiving. I thank you, God, that your grace is what's kept us. And Father, even now as we're about to speak, we declare, oh God, that flesh is dead but that you, Lord, will speak in and through me. Father, I am just but a lump of clay. It is not words, but it is the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that makes preaching effective. So now, Lord, I ask that you step in and do what no other power can do. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I am still here, and it is by the grace of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We are reading today from, oh, praise the Lord, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Thank you. 
And we'll be reading from verse 7. You can stand in the presence of the Lord. And I love the Holy Ghost. I love the Holy Ghost. He always confirms. And it says, even though I received such a wonderful revelation from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now, and as we know, it says my grace is usually sufficient. Thank you, Holy Ghost. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Hallelujah. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. I am still here, and it's by the grace of God. Thank you, Jesus. Brothers and sisters, as we know, Black Friday is a day after Thanksgiving. To many people, characterized here in the United States by extreme consumerism. This is a holiday is what's known as what kicks off the Christmas season. But have we ever stopped to consider how ironic Black Friday really is? We spend the day before with friends and families being thankful for what we have, only to wake up early the next day to wait hours in line to buy a bunch of things that we really don't need. Just less than 24 hours prior, we begin to applaud ourselves of what we are thankful for. Before Thanksgiving Day is over, many people forget about what they're thankful for and begin to think about how they're going to transition from the table. How am I going to get off this couch to get into line? Before the meal has fully settled well, you know, the turkey is still there. Materialism has encroached a day dedicated for Thanksgiving. It has been said that we as a country cannot appreciate and give thanks before people begin to contemplate how they're going to get the next best deals for the things they wished that they had. After we pause to give thanks for what we, see, what we have now, how crazy is it that we immediately rush out to get things we don't need? After we've given thanks for life, our family, our health, and remain with that spirit, instantly we see how it transcends that all people, different races, creeds, colors, camp outside of big box stores, running through aisles, doing their best to avoid getting trampled, to fight somebody for a drastically reduced no-name TV, or even worse, come to blows over the latest LOL doll. The day that's meant to be a celebration of gratitude for family, friends, and community has become the precursor of mass consumption. By seeking for more than what we currently have, we end up negating the purpose of the entire day that we gave thanks for yesterday. Because what we're doing, whether we realize it or not, is that we are implying that what we have is not enough. Which means somehow we can never really be grateful for what we currently have. This chaos of Black Friday highlights how crazy people can get when they're determined to get something. But may I decree and declare that there may be an even greater, deeper issue. That it's not about things, but that there's something within them that indicates that they are simply just not satisfied. 
and it seems to get worse every year. According to reports, the total spent on Black Friday year after year increases. We are consuming more and more as a society with every passing year. And what's scary, that is even within a global pandemic, it has not stopped our desire for more. According to this uh, statistic, it's called Statistic Brain, it appears that people just get a rush, not just from getting what they want or what they need at a good price, but for spending for the sake of spending and consuming just because we can. American culture, especially, has become a society that defines ourselves by our toys, the things that we have. Simply put, we're a selfish nation, pampering ourselves with materialistic things that we use to validate ourselves. With over $9 billion spent in one day, we saw what it seems to be a 20% increase over what was spent last year. Thank you for the confirmation, sir. Now, brothers and sisters, I am not saying that purchasing things in and of itself is bad. Because we all have needs, and there is nothing wrong with getting things. We also understand that things need to be replenished regularly. Somehow, though, whether it's food, whether it's objects, whether it's love, whether it's an old Android phone, we need to replenish things regularly. But there is something to be said about the need to constantly get new things and never ever being satisfied with what we have. There is something wrong that what we once purchased an object that fulfills our need, we still find search to find something later and greater and bigger and better. We can't just be satisfied with a cell phone whose initial purpose is to make a phone call. No, we need a computer in our hand that allows us to record movies and to be fully present. And we need it to do things that needs to tell us the stock market. We can't be satisfied with what it was purposed to do. If I had my iPhone 6S Plus for years, and when the video stops to work, I get upset because I can't text as much. I can't go online as much. But the phone still is able to send and receive calls. The purpose is still good. But we are not satisfied with its purpose. We want more. We make it so difficult that the original intent is forgotten. And we get so hyped up about bells and whistles and then what it was originally purposed to do. We fail to see that sometimes getting new things and having the latest ingredients seeks to fulfill something missing within our lives. Somehow we have gotten it twisted, but the things that we have validated and the people that we have used the things to validate who we are. And so we cling on to these things that tend to fulfill our needs and try to make these objects validate who we are. I am somebody because I've gotten the latest and greatest. That's what we tend to do. We glaze over these things that make us feel important and worthy. And when they get old, not even old, but a has been, we tend to look for the next best thing because what we have is never enough. The desire for always getting something new places us on the forefront because no longer do we own the object, but the object now, in fact, owns us. We now become slaves to these things that we once say we need when the only thing that makes us feel greater or appreciated or value is the look that the money or the gadgets or the toys bring us then we become a slave to them. But not just objects, sometimes we even do it with people. We look here for the affirmation of people. We sell ourselves short and allow ourselves to be demeaned for the love and the value and the respect of people. 
And when someone doesn't reject us, or when someone doesn't love us enough, we look for the next one. And we're on to the next thing. Because no longer do we realize the value that it has, but we are looking to be validated ourselves. There will always be another TV. There will always be another phone. But what happens when these gadgets fade? There will always be someone smarter, someone better looking, someone with a nicer dress. But what happens when all of that fades away? When all the glimmer and the glamour begins to fade? Well, what happens to the intangible things that cannot be measured by things, that cannot be bought, that add value to us and we really find ourselves still looking for more. Brothers and sisters, lately there's been a phrase that many people use, and it's written all over the place. It's found on jewelry. And with the best of intentions, it is written, and it simply says, I am enough. And what's interesting is that it makes people pause and recognize that instead of looking outwardly for validation, that within them, they have everything they need. I'm not saying that that phrase in and of itself is bad. But brothers and sisters, we have to recognize that as nice as it sounds, as believers, we have to recognize that we in ourselves are still yet not enough. Within us, because we are flawed. We are people that are subject to failure. We are subject to mishaps. Brothers and sisters, if we recognize that we recognize that we cannot be enough because we're subjected by sin. But we have to recognize that we must hold on to the confidence that not I am enough, but that my trust in Christ and Christ alone is enough. We recognize that we all sin and we all fail. Yes, we fall short. We cannot rescue ourselves from consequences of some of our bad actions. And if we decide to try and be perfect, it can sometimes lead us down a path where we may lose control. But I have good news to know that no matter what we're looking for, in us we have reason to hope. For it is in Jesus Christ who came here on earth. He is the one that is all sufficient. Jesus Christ is sufficient in every single way. He is trying to remind us that all that we have, all that we need, everything that we can find is in Christ and Christ alone. Christ has the ability to meet every single need, every situation that we have. He is the end result. Once we have Jesus Christ in our lives, we don't need anything else in this life, but even better, in the next. We don't need anything else. No achievements that we can ever accomplish can get us to what Christ has already done Jesus Christ alone is the one that gives us. It is not in rituals and in coming to church. Brothers and sisters, that does not make us good enough. It does not matter if you come here seven days a week. You cannot yet fulfill the law. But it is in Jesus Christ alone and believing upon him that you can be fulfilled. That is what sets him apart as our savior. There are, I was reading recently about uh, the, the caste system in India. And as they live, they feel that if they do more works and do greater works, that they can become a higher level of society. And as they go through life and do greater works, they'll move up to another higher level. But what Christ is telling us is that it's not about good works. It is just believing in him and him alone. I have what you need. And instead of looking for things, Look for Christ. He alone has the ability to be our sufficient solution. God was ordained to be our savior, and he gives us the power even though we don't deserve it. And brothers and sisters, this is where grace steps in. 
In order for us to recognize and fully receive God's grace, we must have to understand is that we have to recognize that God's grace steps in at the end of our ability. He tends to come in when we have given all that we have and we still fall short. God's grace is there to make the difference. God's grace covers the gap. When I could not go to where he was, when my sins were piled up high against me, God's grace and his blood covered me. And God's grace is what we need. We must understand that God is, his grace is there to help us. And in order for us to fully experience God's grace, we have to get to a point where we're no longer saying that it's about us. Okay, I'll do 75% of the work, and God, you can come in. But no, God's grace is saying, I need you to have full and utter and total reliance upon me. I need you to lay every single weight down upon me and believe him for it. God's grace is so sufficient, and it's available and God is telling us that his strength is made perfect in weakness. Brothers and sisters, we are going through what seems to be probably one of the most, the most challenging years for many of us. But God is beginning to tell us, look at Paul, that even when we're weak, jobs lost, the economy is down, my grace is sufficient. God is telling you that I don't know what your particular situation is, but where you are weak, God's grace is there to step in. God's strength is made perfect when you're weak. And what we may feel to recognize is that sometimes as believers, we get so excited and believe that if I just pray about it, if I pray for five minutes, I'm expecting God to move. But what happens when God doesn't answer our prayer immediately? When we go through painful experiences, what is it that we do? We call our friends. We always go through option A, B, C, and D without first really coming to the source of our strength. Well, what should we do in our first response? I don't know what you're going through amidst this pandemic. It could be job loss. It could be issues with finance. It could be family issues that you're dealing with. But what do we tend to do? Do we cry and complain? Do we tend to just give up our hands? Do we tend to take the ostrich approach and put our head in the sand and pray that it just blows over? No, let's take a look at Paul. What did he do? Our first and the situation should always be taking it to prayer. Paul says, I had an issue. And isn't that great to know that the great apostle Paul, he who was this, the chief among chiefs, the apostle, had an issue. That in spite of how God used him with boldness, he still had an issue. Brothers and sisters, it's grateful to know that, guess what? God is still able to use you with and in spite of your issue. But what should we do when we have a situation that's painful, an issue that we seem to cry all night long, when our tears are watered in prayer and our pillows are watered, what should it do? We should take it to prayer. The song reminds us, what a friend we have in Jesus. All of our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry every single thing to God in prayer. Prayer is communication. It does not mean that we will automatically escape the pain or the sorrow. Jesus Christ himself as he was there in the garden of Gethsemane, there in agonizing pain, asked for God to remove the cup from him. He was there in great agony to the point where he prayed, where the sweat became as drops of blood. He asked for God to remove him from the issue. However, as he prayed, he had a resolute fact to say, Lord, nevertheless, not my will but thine be done and if Jesus can go through that as we go through our issues that we may feel that we are insufficient understand if we can get to 
to a point in prayer where we lean and rely and give everything over to God. We need to watch God work. What we understand, just like Paul, was prayer. He prayed three times about whatever it was that ailed him. Some say it was a physical condition. But when he got his answer, it wasn't what he was expecting. Jesus, can you take it away? Jesus, can you take this away? Jesus, can you take this away? And he says, no. He was asking for God to remove the pain. I don't know who's here that has been praying for God to move whatever painful issue it is in your life. He was waiting for God to heal the way we expect. I don't know who has a family member that is going through some issues and we are expecting full and complete physical healing here. But what if the Lord chooses not to do so? Instead of healing God decides to give you something better. That instead of healing, I am giving you my grace. That instead of doing how it is, it may not look like, but I'm going to give you grace to help you through. God's grace is sufficient enough to take us through any and all trials that we face here on earth. His grace will take us through the darkest of nights with a smile. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. Why? Because thou art with us. His grace will sustain us when everything else around us has failed. I recall the story of the widow, and they were coming to take her two sons. She did not have much, but God said, I'm not going to go ahead and just pay the creditors off you still have a bill that's due but what I am going to do is I'm going to take what you have and add grace to it God has a way that in the middle of painful situations if you go to him in prayer he is saying I am the all sufficient one I will give you what you need He's never promised to take us out of the situation all the time but he's promised to be with us the disciples were riding in the boat with Jesus, Mark chapter 5, one of my favorite stories. And here they are in the boat, and they recognize that Christ is sleeping. The storm is raging. He is there with them. And as you go through it, he is able to speak to winds above and waves below. God's grace will sustain you. When everything else around us will fail, God's grace will, will never, ever fail you. God has the ability to take the things that ail us and then use them for our glory. When we take a look at David, there he was in the cave of Adullam waiting. And what we realize is that he there then recognized that God's grace was with him. Although his son was chasing him, he did not realize that he had a whole army ready to fight with him. God's grace sustains Paul had the nerve to call what was ailing him a minister of Satan buffering him. He recognized that while Satan could only go so far, he did not kill him. And God gave him the ability to withstand. Brothers and sisters, God's grace can help us withstand even in the hottest of conditions. Sister Lorraine, what do you mean? The three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, decided therefore in a middle of what was a painful situation, they were there and declared that they would not bow. It was in their prayers that as they waited, they decided to make a decision. The king made a decree to now throw them into the fire. What's so interesting is that as they turned the fire up seven times hotter, what happened is that it killed those that threw them in. 
So it's not saying that the fire or what you're going through has the ability to take you out. Clearly exhibits A, B, and C demonstrated that. But what God's grace did is that while they were in the fire, what killed those on the outside sustained those that were on the inside. God's grace is telling you, I don't know what you're facing in the middle of this pandemic, but God's grace has a way to cover and shield you. And as they came out, what I love about the story is that they said these three boys didn't even smell like smoke. What killed others on the outside sustained them. And God is saying, my grace is sufficient to keep you in the midst of your suffering. What's interesting to know then, we now must take a look at whatever we're going through and change our perspective. We see here that you must change your attitude in the middle of the situation. Brothers and sisters, I read a story, and it was interesting that there were two brothers the first brother became a raging alcoholic. And every time people saw him on the street, they felt bad for him. And he said to them, I just looked at what my father did. The second brother that we see was an upstanding man in the, um, in the community. He did not have a sip of liquor. When they asked him, how did you become who you are? His response was, I just looked at what my father did. Brothers and sisters, two people given the same situation. However, their perspectives changed their outcome. Brothers and sisters, as we're going through whatever it is that we're facing, Facing. May I dare that you begin to change your perspective on whatever is ailing you, whatever situation or thorn is in your flesh that may cause you to feel weak. You have to recognize that this can be an opportunity for the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ himself to get glory out of it. Once I begin to change my attitude and say that this situation looks like something that God can get in, this is a situation where God's grace can be manifested. This is a situation where I can now say that here in my weakness, here in my inadequacies, here in my failures, God can get the glory. I now then make a turn to say, God, whatever it is you can use for your glory. So then I begin to change how I look. Yes, I may not have everything that I need. Yes, my body may be rocked with pain. Yes, I may not have the finances. But when I begin to lean on God's grace, I have a testimony with which he can begin to work with. So if it's cancer that's racking my body, I may be able to show the oncologist the healing power of Jehovah Rapha. Let him do the work and let him be sufficient. So we've got to change our attitude. Look at it for an opportunity to bless. If the check is short, I don't know how you're going to do it, Jesus. But he finds a way to bless you every single time. If the people are arguing, I don't know how you're going to do it. But watch him work. No longer a curse. But let me see it as a blessing. Because I can boast that I can say, Lord, I may feel inadequate, but it's not about me. Because God's glory can then be seen in my situation. Psalms 119 verse 71 says, it was good for me that I may have been afflicted. Why? That I may learn thy statues. Sometimes these situations push and propel us to greater de depths in God. It is the storm that forces our roots to grow deeper. Brothers and sisters, when there is dry land, when there's not enough water on the base level, sometimes trees and plants allow their roots to get deeper and deeper because there is water underneath. Sometimes whatever we're experiencing is pushing us into survival. We're used to being comfortable. And sometimes God is saying, I need to take you out of your comfort. 
comfort zone. Do you really trust me like you say that you will? I may have answered your prayer the first time, but will you call on me if I don't answer? I am giving you the grace to sustain. My mother used to tell me this story. And she used it so much. She says, baby eagles, they're perched when the mother builds the nest. Of course, it's not built on the low ground. It's built high. But underneath all the softness and the feathers, she intentionally puts within the nest thorns. And they are so interwoven that when it's time, for the eagle to fly, what the mother does is remove the soft feathers, making it a little bit uncomfortable. That's right. There's a little bit of pain. What was so soft and serene every once in a while? God is saying, I have to remove this because how can I get you to exercise your muscles? How can I get you to be able to fly if you stay right here in your nest? So what tends to happen is that he is now hungry. Out the nest, the eagle tends to go, not really fully knowing how to fly. They'll drop about 10, 20 feet on their own. And guess what happens? Mother comes right Right there to pick them back up and what happens is that they'll take that and they'll do it again and again and again till the bird begins to now stretch their wings and become the eagle that's meant to glide and soar could it be that 2020 has come Lorraine could it be that the pandemic has come to show us that it is time to learn to flex our wings maybe God hasn't answered your prayer the first time but he's saying I need you to learn to lean on me I need you to trust me I need you to be able to grow so that you are able to soar and could it be I need to see because we love the view of the eagle when it's soaring. Could it be that whatever you're facing, God is using it to build your muscles, gain your wings, so that you could be a thing of amazement and beauty in the sky all by yourself? God is saying, I need to take this situation. My grace is sufficient to keep you. The baby eagle doesn't recognize that the falling out has the ability to make him great. But whatever it is, God, I thank you. He is preparing you and molding you even in the darkest of nights. When you cry, God, where are you? I am building you. I am building you up. I am building you up. Why? Because my strength, God's strength, the all-sufficient one is made perfect in your weakness. God is the one. He is the grace giver. He cannot lie to us. His grace for endurance and his, joy and his glory come from us, come to us. And it is an example of his love. God is telling us that not only am I dispiriting favor to you, but I'm also using Jesus Christ to make intercession for you. So as we cry, as we go through, we have to recognize that Jesus Christ is there interceding on our behalf. He is there to give us the grace giver. He says, my grace is sufficient my grace is enough you don't have to look any further you don't have to go anywhere the most needful thing that you need here on earth is God's grace grace has once and all settled everything on earth it is what God's grace has used because he's died for our sins God is his grace is given to us he gives to us what we need before we even need it. Brothers and sisters, can you imagine the children of Israel, over three million Israelites in the wilderness for what should have been a short journey, 
40 day, for 40 years, they didn't say that they changed their shoes. For 40 years, not one hole. God is saying, my grace is sufficient to keep you in the driest of conditions. My grace is sufficient to extend what you need. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is God's grace. Our God who is not only we speak of saves, but it supplies, it supports, it gives us everything that we need to overcome. It may not look like the picture that we want, but God's grace will keep us. And who else? But of course, Paul knew about God's grace when he was riding on the ship in the midst of the storm. And the Lord said to him, don't worry about it. All 270 passengers are going to get to the other side. Little did he know that the trip would involve a shipwreck. Although they came on broken pieces, not one of their lives were lost. And God used that as a testimony Brothers and sisters, as we go through the end of this year, reminding ourselves, many people are still worried and fearful, but God is saying to you today, my grace is sufficient. God has given us promises. He is saying that my sufficient grace is here to save you. My sufficient grace is here to perfect that's what was within you what do we mean by perfecting God is able to now make it your name great he has the ability to finish what he has started in you when we look at David David seemed like he was young and inexperienced but God's grace perfected him to fight the biggest battle of his life God's grace equips us he gives us everything that we need second Peter 2 says his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness to the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory we must recognize that once we have given our lives to Christ we no longer need to fend for ourselves sister Lorraine what do you mean ask David when they went to put Saul's armor on him he said no I don't need that I just need grace for what God's given me I've given the ability to fight this battle I don't need anything else I don't need your armor all I need is what God's given me and he was able to defeat he was able to defeat the Goliath and give them the victory God's grace blesses us that we can find that bless us be the Lord God blessed be God and the God of our father our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in place in heavenly places in Christ what we have to recognize is that this all sufficient one in the middle of pandemic we are still being blessed in the middle of whatever situation we're facing God's grace yet still blesses God's sufficiency completes for us in him everything that we need. And God's grace provides us through Jesus Christ. And no longer are we, um, I'm so sorry, God provides us the love. He then therefore gives us everything that we need. Philippians 4 reminds us that God will supply every need of ours according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. God has the ability, his grace is sufficient to give us everything that we need. And in the midst of everything that we're going through, God's grace will strengthen us that when we are weak, when we are at our lowest, we can lean upon him and call on him for strength. That's what he tells us. He says, I called on God three times to remove this. And God is saying, no, I'm leaving it there. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. So I have a reason to boast. 
that although I'm going through some things, I am not by myself. Although I may feel inadequate and insufficient, I can boast that God yet still is with me and glory so that the power of Christ may dwell within me. And when we're here, brothers and sisters, at this stage, believing God for greater, and it doesn't look like what we're expecting, God is telling you everything that you already have is what you already need. This is contingent that we are a believer and that we receive the grace of God. Brothers and sisters, as we now go through this week, heading into the last month of this year, we don't know what the future holds. But while we're in the middle, God is here to tell you that my grace my grace, my grace is sufficient to keep you. My grace is sufficient to sustain you. My grace is sufficient to equip you with everything that you need. And that is only contingent today. If there is someone that's on the outside, if you're listening, God is saying that I can sustain and keep you in the midst of whatever is paining you, whatever is troubling you. I just need you to believe and rely on me. And in order for us to rely on him, we first have to accept him as Lord and Savior of our lives. So if you are listening today under the sound of my voice, and you have not yet made the decision to follow Jesus Christ, whatever it is that you're searching for, there is all sufficiency in him. So many things that we look for, it is in Christ alone. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. God's grace is sufficient. If there's anyone here today that's going through anything and they need a little more grace to trust him, we're here to pray with you. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him o'er and o'er. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him, just to take him at his word, just to rest, just to rest upon his pride, just to know, to know, the says the Oh, Jesus, 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 how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him on. if you're here and you need a little more grace we're here to pray with you if you could just raise your hand that way we will pray with you and if you are watching and you need a little bit more grace god is here to say that my grace is perfected my grace is sufficient you don't have to look anywhere further. It is found in Jesus Christ alone. And as we pray today, wherever you are, we are going to believe God at his word. 
He is saying, I may not take you out of it, but my grace will sustain and carry you through it. How I, I trust him. How I prove him more and more. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Jesus, oh for grace, oh for grace, oh for grace, oh for grace to trust him more. Father, we thank you for your grace. Father, we recognize now that in some of our darkest moments, when our backs were against against the wall your grace was there to shield us and to protect us father we're so grateful that we did not lose our minds that we did not buckle under the weight of the pressure because lord we now recognize that your grace was there to lift burdens. Father, we are so grateful, oh God, that there were times that we felt like we were falling. But now, Lord, we recognize that it was your grace teaching us how to fly and soar. So, Father, right now, we take a look back over our lives and we thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord God, for the times you've covered. We thank you for the times you've equipped. We thank you for the times that you have been there to empower us. Lord, we thank you that you didn't take us out of the situation, but you shielded and protected us in the midst of it. Father, so as we now give you thanks for your grace, we recognize that then there's some areas in our lives where we feel like we are deficient. There are some situations, some thorns, some issues that we have. And right now, Lord Jesus, you who are the sovereign Lord, we believe that you can do anything. God, but we declare all over this house, if you choose to deliver, we give you praise. But if you choose to bring us through it, we thank you and receive your grace. Father, I pray even now, we stand in the gap for every one of your sons and daughters that stood to say God I need more of your grace even now God I pray that you would open up the floodgates of heaven would you look down upon your sons and daughters and would you extend more grace to them God I pray in the name of Jesus that they would begin to see your hand at work God that we would change our perspective Lord God whatever it is that we're facing that we would begin to trust you that we will look for opportunities for you to show yourself mighty and strong. God, I pray that we will get the, uh, the gumption and the boldness that whatever we're going through, uh, although we may feel inadequate, we recognize that you, oh God, with us is the majority, that we can do all things through you. We ask for grace as we're going through our trials that as we face them in the confidence in you that you would get the glory out of our lives lord we don't know what the rest of this year is going to bring but we do know that you are with us we do know that your grace is sufficient and we rely on that god so we leave here boasting in our weaknesses boasting in our insufficiencies why because your grace is made perfect so where we are weak we declare strength where we are weak. We declare strength. Strength for the journey, God. We thank you even now. We give you glory. We give you honor. And we give you praise for your grace in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank God for his grace and we give him all the glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. If you believe God today, and you're walking out of here with a different perspective about your situation. Lift your hands and just give him praise. God, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you, oh God, that I am not defeated. My head is not cast down. But because you are the greatest power, we will never be defeated. Hallelujah. 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 We are in the fire.
fire, but we're not consumed by the fire because of God's grace. Hallelujah. We are so thankful that you have decided to spend time with us to worship with us, all the people that are watching online on behalf of the best senior pastor in all the land, Bishop Courtney Hugh Williams and uh, the right lady, Myrna Williams. Uh, they are not here today, but they are busy on ministry doing the Lord's work. We just welcome you, and we just want to invite you, if you have been blessed by this message, any of those messages, please come by and visit us. We are a safe federal guideline guaranteeing place of worship. Praise the Lord. We are safe. We have faith, but recognize safety. So if you need prayer, please feel free to call the numbers. They're available to you, and may God continue to bless you. Amen. God is great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. His grace is sufficient. Hallelujah. And it's not over. Whatever you're going through, it's not over. Hallelujah. Ah, I feel that in my spirit. It's not over. God's grace is sufficient. So as we leave here, praise the Lord. I know the saints are excited. Praise God as we, <laughs> we leave here. We want to also remember to pray for our pastor and the team that are in Jamaica right now, that God will continue to make ways for them, that God will give them grace to complete the ministry that they have started. Amen? Hallelujah, hallelujah. For those that weren't here last week, what I love about God's grace is where we seem to have fallen short, God was able to just once again give us exactly what we needed. And if that alone, we give God thanks that he has put his stamp and seal upon that mission. So continue to keep them in prayer. Um, any of the other announcements, please remember that we meet for prayer at 530 on the prayer line. Bible study this week. Look at me. Praise the Lord. Yes, I got the thumbs up. Praise the Lord. I just want to make sure. I don't want to miss anything. Praise the Lord. Now, as we, as we leave from this house, hallelujah, may the blessings of the Lord be with us. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his throne to the only wise God, be all majesty, glory, dominion, and power, both now and forever. The people of God say amen. Wave to your brethren, give them a good elbow. I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. God bless you.